Um, <laughs> to be a bit more serious, think back to when you were little. I know it's a long time ago for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I totally didn't mean that. Well, I'm guessing that at least a few of you got one of the things that you wanted to be when you were little from a book. Stories have always inspired us to be Supermans and Cinderella's, Harry Potter's, or Nancy Drew. Me, when I was little, I wanted to be a pioneer. You know, the type with the bonnet and the braids and the <laughs> skirt dress. That's actually me for Halloween. This was not several years ago. Yeah, that was me this year. I know, I'm really nerdy. <laughs> See, I was inspired by Little House on the Prairie. I love those books. Raise your hand if you've read any of the Little House books. Oh yeah! Why is it only females? <laughs> well, I had a very special place in my seven-year-old heart for Little House on the Prairie. I had the entire box set, all eight books, Little House in the Big Woods, Three Bees, Happy Golden Years, FYI, occupying a shrine-like place of special honor on one of my very full bookshelves. I read about Laura Ingalls Wilder's adventures and misadventures from Wisconsin and North Dakota and everywhere in between. Along with my existing giant list of aspirations, I wanted to be a pioneer just like her. But since that wasn't too likely in the 21st century, there weren't too many more western lands to explore, I settled for something else, being a teacher. I found something very romantic about teaching as it was portrayed in the Little House books. There was something so appealing, so romantic about standing up in the front of this one-room schoolhouse, blackboard behind you, ruler in hand, and if a kid did so much as to move out of line, whack on the hand with that ruler. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I was actually a really violent child, wasn't I? Now, in the last book in the series, These Happy Golden Years, Laura is going to teach in this rural country school, and she's still a teenager, younger and smaller than many of her students, and she has to prove herself to this older crowd. She's not quite the whack you on the hand with a ruler type of teacher, but she does have this challenge of maintaining discipline and proving herself, gaining these kids' respect. Since I love the book so much, I also love the idea of being a teacher myself. Now this was a somewhat strange career choice at seven years of age. <laughs> Young people don't seem to tend automatically towards wanting to teach, I wonder why. Automatically or culturally, um, I'm half Chinese and this is, you can tell, uh, because my writing is really bad in Chinese. But the Chinese word for teacher, lao shi, literally means old master. So to be a young old master is somewhat incongruous. But I got my opportunity to be exactly that sooner than I expected. I might have mentioned that, along with my giant, comprehensive list of potential careers, I really wanted to be a writer. I love reading and writing so much that when someone told me, nah, I don't like reading, in a nonchalant tone, it shattered my world. What? You don't like reading? How is this possible? It's like going against the law of gravity. I decided I would simply go around to various elementary schools and make other kids like reading and writing. I was very adamant about that. As it turns out, it's not just elementary students who don't necessarily like reading and writing. So soon I was facing um, audiences of high schoolers, middle schoolers. Keep in mind that I was like this tall, and when I published my first book, Flying Fingers, barely eight years old. So here is this eight-year-old up in front of 10, 12, 14-year-olds, and I felt a little bit like Laura Ingalls Wilder having to prove herself to the older kids. I had to establish my credibility. So I modeled myself after what I knew a teacher was, and that was the all-knowing, front-of-the-class, ruler-in-hand, little house on the prairie type of teacher. I had to ensure that I was the authority in the room, and that meant knowing more than the teenagers I was presenting to. Being a teacher, I thought, meant that I would be teaching all the time, not learning. So every time I stood up in front of a group of kids, I was putting on this invisible suit of armor. Fortunate in the long run, but unfortunately for my ego, there was a bit of a problem. I didn't know everything, and I couldn't pretend to. My suit of armor was starting to show some cracks. My subject area of expertise was language arts. Mostly I spoke from a motivational standpoint, the aforesaid trying to motivate kids to be interested in reading and writing. But increasingly I started instructing students on specific types of writing. How to weave a personal or fictional narrative, whip up a persuasive argument, what have you. When I was 10 years old, I began using video conferencing to connect to students around the nation and speak about writing. And I connected with a group of fifth graders in New York one time who present on some descriptive writing techniques. 
I was fairly confident. I thought, this writer's okay. I'll run over some figurative language, some ways and metaphors, and we'll explore show not tell, and maybe if they're precocious onomatopoeia, because that's just a fun word to say. <laughs> Little did I know quite how precocious they were. Since they seemed to know a lot, I started asking more questions. Students began raising their hands to give examples of similes and metaphors. Someone mentioned onomatopoeia, and I typed everything up on a Word document as we've been along, making a list. So far, so good. And then one kid raises his hand and says, what about hyperbole? <laughs> hyperbole? Hyperbole? My mind started spinning and going into overdrive and trying to find an instance where I heard that strange word hyperbole before. And I was basically just trying to think, what the heck does hyperbole mean? So I stared blankly for a moment, and then I asked, hyperbole, right, uh, how do you spell that? <laughs> now, any of you who have ever run into an acquaintance who you know you know, but you forget their name, and you ask them how to spell it under the pretense of writing it out, <laughs> know I was bluffing. I had no freaking idea what hyperbole meant, and the spelling of it, which is like hyperbole, was not going to help me deduce the meaning either. So I just said, hyperbole, very good, and continued on. Does anyone here know what hyperbole is? Raise your hand if you're familiar with the definition of that word. Oh, good. Very literary audience here. Well, hyperbole is basically a fancy word for overstatement or exaggeration, so um, this bag weighs a ton. That's hyperbole. I found this out directly after that video conference when I ran upstairs, looked it up, gnashed my teeth that I hadn't known it because I could rattle off onomatopoeia, apostrophe, similes, metaphors, but darn you, hyperbole. And I told this frustrating, humiliating story to my mom. I am not using hyperbole when I say that I was in the depths of ten-year-old despair. <laughs> <laughs> but my mom just shushed me and told me to look at it as a learning experience. Now, for those of you who don't know my mom, who is sitting in the audience right there, she looks at everything as a learning experience. <laughs> oh, you nearly got run over by a bus while jaywalking across a busy New York City street? Learning experience. <laughs> I'm sorry, by the way. Uh, not really. But basically, I didn't take what she said very seriously. Fast forward about two years, and I'm doing another video conference. I'm asking students to provide examples of adjectives to describe this main character that we're creating. And someone says, beautiful. Easy, right? I start typing up B-E-U, wait a second, that's not beautiful. B-E-A-E, -E, that's definitely not beautiful. I'm backspacing and I think, beautiful, you know this. And the kids are kind of laughing and swerving a little bit because, come on, Adora's speed talk, the word is easy, how come you aren't spelling it? And maybe it would have been okay if I didn't pride myself on being such a good speller, but you're looking at a girl who can spell deoxyribonucleic acid, D-E-O-X-Y-R-I-B-O-N-U-C-L-E-I-C-A-C-I-D. -E -E and um, so add that to the fact that I was the writing content provider, and you set up the scene for another uh, humiliation. Finally, I laughed too, more out of embarrassment than anything, because come on, imagine not being able to spell beautiful. And I just asked them to help me out and spell it for me. They obligingly do that over their laughter, and we move on. Those two stories really highlight how I began to realize that maybe, just maybe, being the teacher in the stiff, invisible suit of armor made me too inflexible about being able to learn from my students who were, after all, the same age that I was. But it's not just about learning from your peers. I've heard stories of, and you might have even had, some grown-up teachers who weren't especially enthused about the idea of learning from their students. Whether it stems from the idea that I need to prove my authority or superiority, or the idea that they're younger, they can't teach me anything. A reluctance to be a learner as well as a teacher can be surprisingly common. Take technology as a case in point. There are many amazing teachers who want to utilize students as a resource for learning about technology, and there are others who won't let students get near them. When that kid from New York raised his hand and stumped me with hyperbole, I probably should have stopped, asked him more, and given him a chance to teach me and his classmates something more. Instead, I just moved on. But imagine if I had told him to shut his mouth, to stop being a smart aleck, and that we haven't reached that concept yet, so keep quiet. I don't think any teacher would actually say that directly to a student. But in essence, that is what we hear every day. With, please don't read ahead in the text, you'll get out of sequence, you're moving too fast for the rest of the class, or teachers who are open to learning from students. One of my favorite teachers was exactly the opposite. To give you a bit of background, my mom ran what was essentially a sort of customized school for my sister and me and uh, some neighborhood kids, and Felisa was one of our teachers. 
She loved Mexican revolutionary history and Alexander Hamilton above all else, with the possible exception of coming up with nasty epithets for President Bush in Spanish. <laughs> and she was very close to us. One of the awesome things was that because we didn't have a fixed curriculum, our teachers taught what they loved and knew well, so we learned about everything from art history to anatomy to Emiliano Zapata. But while Felisa was an expert on many things, she also admitted her weaknesses readily. We sometimes helped her with spelling, for instance, but that didn't make us suddenly think, oh, she's a bad teacher, or that we could let chaos reign in the classroom. It made us realize that we were integral parts in our class's success. We were like jigsaw pieces in this larger puzzle. But a really good example of how Felisa made herself human came from a uh, shared weakness of math. I was really bad at math when I was little, and I would say that I still am, except I discovered using this one. My math skills need improvement. And I would actually <laughs> get so stressed out about the idea of having to do mental math in class or whatever that I would burst into tears. Yeah, I know, embarrassing, right? And be so overcome that I would have to leave the room. Now, one time this happened, and instead of ordering me out to dry my tears and get back to doing math, Felisa told me that when she was quite young, she had had a similar experience. She had been placed in a gifted program in school, but the unfortunate thing was she had gifted classes all around, and she wasn't quite up to speed on math. She, like me, had had difficulty keeping up. That suddenly made her empathetic. Here was someone who may not have been the best teacher if you evaluated her purely on her knowledge of math, but the fact that I felt she knew what I was going through made a huge difference to me as a student. Looking back on these stories of unknown words, misspelling very simple ones, and shared difficulties with math, I realized that we may underestimate the value of one very important thing that I think makes a good teacher. We know that passion for a subject and knowledge about it, caring for your students, and on your feet thinking are all necessary <coughs> traits for good teachers. But we rarely bring up the importance of being human. As students, we're used to our teachers as authority figures, all-knowing, omnipotent, make no mistake. And as teachers, we often feel pressured to maintain some sort of facade. But our favorite main characters, usually, aren't the goody-two-shoes with the perfect lives. They're the Harry Potters, whose bravery sometimes errs on the side of stupid. Or Laura Ingalls Wilder, who can't help but be vengeful and mean at that nasty mean girl Nellie Olson sometimes. They're the fictional characters who are every bit as flawed as we, the readers, are. Our favorite leaders aren't the ones who stay in the palace and protect themselves while the fighting's going on. It's Alexander the Great leading the charge against Darius. I'm guessing he was behind that picture, but still. Winston Churchill, who stayed in London and visited the bombed out buildings in the worst days of the Blitz. So why should our favorite teachers be any different? I'm still working on exploring how I can be a better learner at the same time as being a teacher. One way I try to put myself on the front lines when I teach is through doing collaborative writing exercises with students. And this is why I feel like there's often a big gap between point A, where the teacher lectures about the concept, say, here's what makes a good persuasive argument, here's your thesis statement, um, and point B, where we get assigned the one-page essay by tomorrow, and make sure it utilizes all the things mentioned in that lecture. The average student might look at their friends, sigh a little, it's another essay, go home, stare at the sheet, and say, write a good thesis statement, what's good? And overall, it can seem like a pretty daunting task. So with my collaborative writing exercise, I try to bridge that gap. I take suggestions live from students, we work on a piece together, they see it come alive in front of their eyes. Not only does it provide more clarity, it also has a poison tester effect. Oh, the teacher is doing it, it can't be that bad. I was rereading These Happy Golden Years, which is the last book in the Little House series, and a little gem of dialogue caught my eye. It's a short part, but it made me realize that maybe Laura Ingalls Wilder and I, though separated by more than a century, weren't so different after all. Sure, she might have taught in a one-room schoolhouse up in front of a blackboard and me in front of a video conference and camera, but we both started out trying to prove ourselves to an older crowd. And eventually, she discovered a bit sooner than I that collaboration reciprocal learning, putting herself at the same level as her students, not all omnipotent superiority was the way to go. In this passage, a student in Laura's class named Martha is facing a lot of difficulty with grammar, diagramming, sentences, and the like, and Laura says, I would like to go over it myself. I'm trying to keep up with my class in town, and grammar is hard. If you would like to, we can go through this lesson together. Later, Martha says, I understand it now. After this, I won't dread the grammar recitation so much. Don't underestimate that very short passage. Much like how Felicia related to me, 
with her story about struggling with math herself, Laura and Martha are sharing this common goal. This is not the you didn't get your grammar right, so now go write five lines on the blackboard as punishment type of teacher. This is the teacher as learning partner. Maybe there are some big ideas to be found in Little House. So as we go into our daily lives, whether it's students, teachers, administrators, parents, business people, maybe we should worry less about do I look good, am I authoritative, am I going to be a failure, and more about am I making clear that I am relatable, I am human, I have vulnerabilities and weaknesses just like everyone else. And most importantly, am I learning? Because learning from your students is not a weakness. As an eight-year-old, I thought all teachers did was teach, not learn. Little did I know then what took many beautifuls and hyperboles and fleeces and rereadings of Little House on the Prairie to teach me. As the pioneering librarian John Cotton Dana said, who dares to teach must never cease to learn. Thank you.